Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey of My Mother's Son podcast. Today, I'm joined with psychologist and founder of Moms Without a Mom, Dr. Melissa Riley. Melissa, thanks for joining me today. Oh, Dan, it is my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. So just to give a little background before we get into the conversation. So Melissa is one of those guests where I actually know her um, prior to reaching out to her through PodMatch and and getting her on the show. We are actually involved in a, in a community um, through Justin Shank, um, who's been a longtime friend of mine, and Melissa's done a lot of work with him as well. Um, and I had another member of that group, uh, Adrian Hart, on the show a while back. So it's great to be able to get familiar faces on the, on the show. I love meeting new people, but I always love getting people on the show that I already have a, a history with and a relationship with. So Melissa, thanks so much for uh, agreeing to be on the show with me today. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. So before we get into the conversation, just, you know, introduce yourself to the audience in your own words, you know, who is Melissa today? Well, I am a mom of two boys who is parenting them without the support and guidance of a mom. And um, I'm also a clinical psychologist and have been doing that for um, over 22 years. And in the past year, I have made the decision to add a coaching program to focus energy on helping other moms that have had the unique challenges of being a mother without having a mom by their side. Yeah, and, and I, I love this. And you, know, you, you and I were in a, a breakout room together um, where we got an opportunity to kind of you know, talk you know, in a smaller group as to what each of us does. And, and you know, what you do resonates with me very much. I, I'm a self-proclaimed mama's boy. You know, obviously, the name of the podcast is The Journey of My Mother's Son. You know, Sandy and I's travels, um, really a way to, you know, bring my mom's legacy to the forefront. Um, so, you know, certainly not a, a mom without a mom, <laughs> um, but still, you know, a son without his mom. I, I understand the importance of the, the role that a mother plays throughout just the parenthood process in general. I mean, my mom's gone since 2005 and, you know, I know how I used to lean on her, um, you know, as a father getting advice from her about parenting. And I can imagine that that bond is even stronger, um, you know, from mother to daughter. So, you know, tell me a little bit about how this started, how, you know, moms without a mom started, what, what inspired you to you know, understand the importance that, that this is? Well, my mom passed away in um, 1999 when I was 25 years old. At um, that time of my life, I was completing my graduate education to become a clinical psychologist. And my focus was very much academic and professional. Um, and um, when my mom died at a very young age, she was only 51 when she died, um, it was really quite difficult. Um, and I went through the grieving process and um, you know, spent a long time uh, working through um, her loss. And then I went through a number of typical adult milestones, you know, got, you know, graduated, got married, um, got divorced, got remarried, um, and, you know, bought homes and started a business and all these things, um, that my mom wasn't a part of. And so I had many years of just recognizing what life was like without having a mom and felt honestly, Dan, that I was doing really good. So I had, I started um, my family later in life. In fact, I was just a few days shy of 38 when my son was born. So it had been um, about 15 years after she had died that, um, or 11 years um, after she had died that um, I gave birth to my son. Actually, no, that's not true. 99, he was born in 2010. Um, but anyway, yeah, 11 years. So <laughs> at that point in my life, 
here I am. I was competent. I was a business owner. Uh, you know, I had my psychological practice. I mean, I was a psychologist. I had treated hundreds of moms. Um, in fact, I even taught human development at the graduate level. So I kind of thought I knew what I was doing. <laughs> um, I knew who I was as a, as a woman. I was competent. And then well, when I became pregnant, um, I had three miscarriages. Um, so that was really difficult. And then, you know, with my, my son, that pregnancy was, was medically fragile, fragile and difficult. And all of a sudden, all these feelings of grief started coming back. Um, I didn't have my mom to talk to. I didn't have other female family members other than my aunt who lived in a different state from me. And I was feeling really very much alone. Now, when I gave birth to my son, I experienced some postpartum, which I predicted. I, I knew I, um, I had been on bed rest for five months. Like I said, it was a difficult pregnancy. I knew I was at risk for postpartum. But what I didn't recognize was the intense feeling of longing and this desire to have somebody that was never going to be in my life again. Um, and so at this time in my life where I thought I would feel this immense joy, I was feeling this really intense feeling of grief. And what I thought I was prepared and ready for became one of the most difficult challenges I ever experienced in my life. And I didn't understand it, Dan. Like I said, I had a lot of resources behind me and yet I was struggling so badly. And so without understanding why, I internalized it as something must be wrong with me. I just must not be cut out to be a mom because I have all this knowledge, but I just can't do this. I, I was insecure, um, you know, overwhelmed. I felt alone, all these things. And it took several years before I realized what was going on. And that was, I was facing the additional challenges of being a mom without the support and guidance of my own mother. Right. And I continued to work um, after having my son. And I started to notice with a number of my patients that also were moms without a mom, that there were some unique circumstances that we had in common. And so the psych nerd and me got all curious, like, oh, okay, what? What's this about? So I did some research and you know what I found? Not much. <laughs> there isn't a lot of research out there about the unique circumstances that moms without a mom face. So I started you know, taking my own notes and, and really reflecting a lot and, and looking into it on my own. And um, like I said, this past year, I made the decision that I can do some research. I can put a real focus on this because I never want other women to feel what I felt. And I, I know they will, right? But I don't want them left feeling like there's something wrong with them simply because they're feeling what most women that don't have their mother in their life um, when they become a mom experience. Yeah. And like you said, I mean, the, the roles that a mother plays in our life, um, you know, really um, are, are so incredible and, you know, hats off to every mom out there um, because, you know, th there's just a different, you know, moms and dads are just wired differently mm -hmm. and nothing against, you know, the dads out there in the world. I'm a dad, um, but there's just something different. And whether that's, you know, the fact that your child was in your body for nine months um, you know, growing before it was exposed to the world. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who who knows for sure why, but there's definitely differences and there's definitely differences in those, you know, relationships. So, um, you know, and certainly you're not the, you know, the first mom without a mother, you know, mm -hmm. but why do you think there was just, as you dug into this, 
so little, um, you know, research out there and, and, you know, so little information available for people going through it. Um, because it, it's something that we don't, we don't talk about, um, in our, you know, Western culture, particularly in the United States where you and I are both, um, located in the last hundred years, the concept of a nuclear family has become the norm. This idea of a mom and dad and children being able to raise a family independently without support is what we idealize and we see as normal. But the reality is, is, is that isn't the way humans have evolved over the millennial. We um, survive on this planet because we come together in community. And so when we lose a member of our community, there are other members that fill in the gaps and provide assistance. And so we, as you know, the, the traditional makeup of family is now, when the mom is absent or we no longer have that in our life, there's this societal expectation that it shouldn't matter. And the reality is, is it does. It matters a lot. Um, because as you've said, our bonds don't disappear once we become adults. They just change. Right. And and um, those connections continue to play a big part in who we are and how we parent and show up in the world. And for me, I define a mom without a mom as any woman who is mothering that doesn't have support and guidance from a loving mom in her day-to-day -day life. And so that includes um, women like myself whose mother has passed away, but that also includes women who don't have an emotional relationship with their mother because of um, abandonment or estrangement or uh, the relationship has become toxic for whatever reason, they too don't have their mom in their day-to-day -day life to be able to reach out to and get support. Um, and then also those women who don't have their mom because they live on different parts of the planet. So our, our military moms, our moms from international schools, our, our moms that are missionaries, Again, they aren't able to reach out and have their mother there um, to help with um, the day-to-day -day stuff because one of the roles moms play is, is um, you know, a go-to person. Yeah. yeah. And I just want to revisit one of the things you said about, um, you know, kind of this nuclear family that we've, we've developed where you know, years ago, it, you know, you would hear the term that it takes a village to, you know, to raise a child. And I think we've, you know, have gotten away from that a little bit where, like you said, we're, we're not as engrossed. I mean, you know, when I was growing up, I mean, it was, you know, it was my teachers and my, you know, sports coaches and my aunts and my uncles and grandparents, along with my parents that, you know, developed me into the man I am. It, it, like you said, we've seemed to put up you know, these walls of, you know, uh, how many times do you hear about, you know, parents and teachers clashing over something that, that happened in the classroom and that sort of stuff. So you know, why do you think we've, we've gotten away from that? Cause I, I mean, clearly it's not, it's not a good road that we're going down in, in my opinion. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've got much more expertise on it than, than I do, but. You um, know. Well, I think there are, you know, I, I I think there are just societal forces, you know, and, you know, geopolitical forces over the last, you know, century that have created, you know, this dynamic of, um, you know, hunkering down into your individual units rather than more of a, a, a communal support system. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest struggles from, you um, moms that I hear, both those with a mom and those without, is that they don't know who to ask their questions of, 
right? They don't know where to go to get help. Now, if they have a strong relationship with their mom, then that makes it, you know, easier. That, that tends to be their first person. Um, and they can feel comfortable if they have a good relationship asking mom, you know, for advice or questions or support or assistance. But if they don't have that, then again, it's this idea people are going to think, I can't do it. You know, you know, I should be able to do it. And, and there's this real sense of shame that moms then start to internalize because they, they can't do it. And the reality is nobody can. Right. Again, we, we're not physiologically designed to take care of all of the needs of our family. We just aren't. Yeah. So what has the, uh, you know, once you, you launched this, mm -hmm. um, what has the response been? And, and again, how, like, I'm sure there's probably some people, you know, who, who come to you a little bit reluctant, you know, because again, you're built like, Hey, I should, I should be able to handle this myself. Am, am I, am I weak because I'm reaching out to someone? You know, so, you know, tell me a little bit about how, how that experience has been for you with people coming in to the you know, program, so to speak. Yeah. Well, I think that's, I think that that's one of the big barriers is first of all, just letting women know that there isn't something wrong with them for having difficulty in um, being a mom because they don't have a mom. And what I've found is that there are, really are three areas that um, tend to be a little more difficult. You know, one is the the grieving process, right? And whether we grieve the, the death of a mom or we grieve the loss of what we had hoped we would have once we become a mom, there's this grieving process that can um, kind of pop up unexpectedly. You know, the second factor that can be more difficult is is um, developing a mom community. Because like I said earlier, moms tend to function as, you know, our go-to person. They give advice so they can be this wise woman. They provide emotional support. They are a, a go-getter. So they, they help with tasks and we can rely on them for support at any time. Well, most people don't have another person that fills all four of those functions. And so building a community that includes, you know, all four of those areas, you know, wise woman, emotional supporter, um, a go-getter and a late night talker, I call her, um, can be a struggle. And then, you know, the, the other area that is hard is developing your own mom identity because we aren't born knowing how to be a mom. We learn how to be a mom by the experience we had ourselves. So if you lost your mom early in life, then you don't have that. If you had a um, conflictual relationship with your mom, then that can be a real struggle. And even if, like myself, you lost your mother later in life, um, you still don't have her to kind of mirror off of, you know, how do I be a mom? How do I deal with these things? How do I think about this? How did you deal with that? Right. You don't have that. So, you know, it's a long winded way of answering the question, but the first thing I, I'm really doing is letting you know, women know that these experiences are normal and natural when you're in this circumstance and that it is okay that you feel this way. You don't need to feel shame. You don't need to feel bad right? That you see other moms that you really care about, other friends who have their moms and these feelings of jealousy crop up. Well, we all do, right? That's, that's normal. That doesn't make you, you know, this horrible woman, right? Um, but there are ways that you can feel better, that you can step into a sense of who you are as a mom, feeling more confident, you know, developing, a community and a set of skills that you can rely on. Um, and that's what I do. I provide that. Yeah. So how does that differ from the, you know, the practice that you've been used to for, you know, your entire career? Yeah. 
That is a great question. Okay, so the, the difference between um, psychotherapy um, versus coaching is really important. As a psychologist, I treat individuals who have um, clinical disorders that bring them into my office. So, so uh, men and women, um, you know, children, you know, older individuals who are experiencing some anxiety or depression, um, uh, medical conditions that they're struggling with, uh, complicated grief process, um, and, and so forth. So they have a, a diagnosable um, condition that brings them in. And um, I assist them with that. And I look at, you know, long-term history patterns of, of who they are. Many of the people I, I treat have, you know, um, significant early life difficulties, you know, traumas, hardships that continue to um, impact their, their current functioning. So it's a very overall um, looking at everything type of approach. With coaching, that is very specific and it anybody can come to a coaching program from a place of health. So I'm not treating a disorder. I'm helping somebody who has, you know, who comes from a place of health um, to improve an area of their life that is causing some discomfort or even distress. So to use an analogy, I like to think of it as the difference between a full length mirror versus a hand mirror, right? The full length mirror, you can see everything, you know, from, you know, many different angles. Um, and that would be what therapy is. Whereas the hand mirror, you're just, you're looking at one specific area and you can kind of, you know, um, focus in, in, in there. Um, and so my coaching is, is that focus in on the, the unique challenges of being a mom without a mom. And that was important to me because there are only, you know, there's so many women out there that would never walk into my office because they don't have, you know, a, a psychological condition. And I wanted to bring awareness to all moms, you know, whether they're struggling with anxiety or depression or not, that, you know, you can feel more comfortable and confident than what you're feeling now. I love that. Was there a, uh, like, so how did you personally adjust to those two different approaches from, you know, the, the full length mirror to the handheld mirror? What, what adjustments did you have to make in, in your approach? <laughs> well, that has been quite of a business journey, honestly, <laughs> for me, because um, as a, a psychologist in private practice, I'm, a, I'm an owner of a, a group practice, me and another partner. And, you know, we've been, you know, it's a thriving practice for over 17 years um, and never had to do any kind of marketing, um, you know, we're well respected in the community. And so that just kind of runs itself and is doing really good. Um, and so I knew for the last um, five years or so, honestly, that I wanted to start incorporating some more wellness, more health related things into what I do, um, just because I was feeling drawn to that. But I, I didn't really know where or how. And when I started really investigating what that might look like for me, professionally, I realized where my passion was, was working with, with moms without a mom specifically. And so then I had to think a lot about, well, how do I do that? And I learned that the, the best way to do that would be to take um, an online approach so that I can reach people all over the world and start building that awareness. So even if, you know, moms aren't, you know, wanting or in a place to seek out my services through coaching. My hope is that they're gaining benefit from the content that I'm putting out there, that they're learning and feeling better about who they are. And so uh, making that conscious decision to do this digitally, you know, or virtually, uh, you know, has been really important to me. So, you know, I, I, when I'm coaching, um, I, I'm not, 
providing psychotherapy. But the reality is I, I can't take away my knowledge as a psychologist. And so I think for me, that has helped me be able to kind of hone in and understand what's going on with my clients um, very quickly because I just, I have that background. And so I can see things pretty clearly because of it. Right. Right. So are your coaching clients or are they coming to you all as individuals or are there some group sessions involved or a little of both? Well, right now I am doing individual um, and I am, my plan will be to create uh, a larger group program that includes some uh, video modules and components um, and some uh, additional supports, but I don't have those created yet. Um, so I have lots of long-term plans, <laughs> but I'm, I'm starting here and, and the individual work is, is a great place to, to start that. But I will in the near future be creating a group, um, pro, not program, but a, a, a social site, whether that be a, a Facebook group or whether that be on a different platform, I haven't decided yet where, um, all of the individuals on my email list will be able to kind of come together in a community. Um, so that I plan on launching, I'm hoping before the end of the year. Awesome. Awesome. Melissa, is there anything that we didn't cover that you think uh, would be beneficial for the, the listeners? I, my most important message is I want, you know, all of these moms to know that they aren't alone. And that they don't need to feel like they are doing everything by themselves and that they don't need to be perfect. And I am here to support you in whatever way I can. You know, I offer a uh, free coaching session, no strings attached, no sales pitch. It's, it's nothing like that. It's just simply so that I can help you um, solve, you know, whatever immediate problem you have in that moment, provide you with some information, some support, kind of next steps for you. Um, and, and that's really important to me that, that I, I give back to other moms. Yeah. I love that. And then if anybody's out there listening, if there are some moms without moms out there listening, um, you know, how do they get a hold of you? Where can they find you on the internet if they do want to engage your services and get involved in the program? Um, probably the easiest two places um, would be my website, which is momswithoutamom.com. Um, so pretty simple. And also on Instagram, it's the same handle. It's, you know, at momswithoutamom. And you know, I have TikTok, which I think is also Moms Without a Mom, um, and Facebook, but I'm, I'm mostly Instagram and um, my website. And all the links can be found in my bio on Instagram as well as um, on my website. And, and so, again, I you know, invite any listeners to, to reach out. I do um, I have some free guides for moms. Um, there's one guide that um, provides an easy strategy to go from being distracted to being more focused on where you want your attention to be with your family. And then another guide that's specifically for moms with, with infants on how to take care of themselves while they take care of their mom, um, themselves, I'm sorry, their baby, not them. <laughs> take care of themselves while they take care of the baby. Because, you know, for me, self-care meant taking care of myself and my baby at the same time because I didn't have anybody to take care of him. So, yeah. so those are two things that, you know, are on my website that are completely free. Awesome. Love it. So Melissa, that uh, brings us to our final question. As you know, the subtitle of the podcast is many little people in many little places. And that comes from the opening lyrics of a Michael Fronte song, Gloria, yeah. which go when many little people in many little places, do many little things and the whole world changes. 
So it's one of the little things that Melissa does on a daily basis to make the world a little bit better place. I give my undivided attention over and over, even if it's only for a few moments, but it is so important to me that when I am in front of somebody, they have all of me. And I think that makes a huge difference. Uh, it, it definitely does, especially with all of the distractions that we have in today's world. Mm -hmm. I think uh, to be fully present is something that's very important. And, uh, you know, it may sound like a little thing, but I think it definitely turns into a, a big thing. So I, I love that answer. So, listen, I really enjoyed this uh, this conversation. And, you know, for all the moms out there listening, just, you know, keep doing what you're doing. Um, and, you know, believe me, again, coming from a son who doesn't have his mom, but what you're doing now, even though you may not understand it, or you may not see the fruits of your labor, um, you are making an impact. And, uh, you know, the, the work that moms are doing out there is incredibly important. So, you know, Melissa, the fact that you're, you're helping moms get through that is uh, very important work. And I, I uh, you know, hats off to you for, for doing that. And uh, for folks out there listening, be sure to check out my other podcasts and blogs at journeymymotherson.com or danclauser.com. While you're there, pick up a copy of my most recent book, The Journey of My Mother's Son, Volume 1. Melissa, again, thank you so much for the time. This is a great conversation. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate it. Uh,